Welcome to today's show on the Sean Bull Show. We have a lot to talk about. We have conservatives, including Donald Trump, Ye West, Babylon B, and others getting back on Twitter. Uh, liberals are melting down. I don't know if you've been watching this, but it has been the most interesting conversation on social media over the past week. We also have Christians ranking highest in generosity in America, according to some new research. And even in the midst of financial crisis, we're watching Christians outgive every other people group, which is so cool. We also have a special guest because of my prophetic word about marriage. We have Ryan Mont. Oh my gosh, I don't know how to say your last name, Ryan, but we will know Montague is here to answer some big questions about how you as a single person can be available for love. So if you listen to that prophetic word and you're like, I need to know what to do next. I know that I'm going to be married. I know that I'm called to be married. What do I do now? Ryan's going to be answering our questions today. All this and more on today's show. We are back after this week's YouTube hack. I don't know if you guys noticed we were hacked on YouTube last week, but we are so grateful because some of you guys gave us some great advice and just the prayers that you guys put up. I mean, it was a crazy hack against a group who decided to try to exploit you, our listeners on YouTube and viewers on YouTube. Um, we're on Rumble, we're on Facebook, but they targeted YouTube and they've targeted about a thousand other people, the creators as well, uh, with this message of false cryptocurrency trying to exploit money. But they targeted us because they felt like you guys would be weak-willed users, but I know they didn't get any money from you because you guys are smart enough to know that this wasn't real. Thank God. And so we had to work with YouTube and they did a beautiful job of getting us back on and secured, which I was shocked because I was told from other creators that they got locked on their account and lost it forever. But we got us back. So thanks to, thanks to those of you who subscribed to our podcast, who helped us, those who subscribed to YouTube. Thanks for subscribing. Also, we want to give a special shout out because we have new members we have a, a membership on YouTube on our channel. If you don't become a partner of our ministry, you become a YouTube member. There's special live chats, questions and answers, and discounts for our store and other things. So I'm going to encourage you guys to become a member. But this this week's members are Caesar, Douglas, De Silvia, Santos, and Kelly Mason. Thank you so much for joining. And I'm so excited about all the members who've joined so far since we just launched this a few weeks ago. Thanks so much. Well, we have a comment section that we do every show before we get to our main stories. And there's so much to talk about. It was hard to pick this week because there's so many things. And part of the reason why we do this show, remember, is to discern what's going on in culture, discern what's going on with spiritual eyes and a spiritual view so that we can have sanity. We can have the balanced, sound mind that Paul talks to Timothy about. We have to have a sound mind, but we can't have that by closing our eyes to what's going on around us. We have to look at it, but then we have to ask God, what's in your heart about this? We have to process it with our spirit. And negative information is going to bombard you all the time. But what you do with that information as a Christian with a biblical worldview, but also spiritual discernment will set you apart in the place of actually having a thriving life versus having a depressed life filled with anxiety, which is happening all around the globe right now. And you don't have to be that person. So this is why we do this show. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Make sure to leave comments, subscribe, hit notifications, all those things. Okay, here we go. You know what to do. The first story I'm going to talk about, this is so weird. This is so weird, you guys. The Ten Commandments of the United Nations for Global Climate Change, they really did it. Several religious leaders from different opposing religions got together on Mount Sinai to give Ten Commandments of Climate Change. And this is not only so world ordery, even for me, who's not conspiracy. It's also interesting that they went to a sacred place to Christians, not any other religion. We have a Swami there. We have a Muslim there. We have you know, just different people from different backgrounds, a Buddhist there, but they decided to do the Ten Commandments. They, they use a Christian tradition on one of our most sacred places, which I thought was so weird. The Pope was one of the ones leading the charge of the United Nations. And this was just something out of a bad end times book. This felt like Left Behind Part 10 or something. I mean, it just felt so weird. I understand the sentiment of what they were trying to do because we do need things to change on the earth, but the global climate group that's behind this they really haven't had any fruit. There's been no change in the climate since they've started pouring trillions of dollars into climate change, now grafting religious leaders into it and using and exploiting their audiences to get more money. Ultimately, this is not a good thing. I am so sad about it. I like the idea of it, an ecumenical group who you know come together to talk about climate change or to talk about environmentalism. I like the idea of that because we do need to make some big changes. Even if you're not a climate change you know, person who doesn't believe in great climate change. We all know that the environment is suffering right now because of humanity. We all know that the earth has been dying since Adam and Eve left the garden and that God wants to restore the earth, that he wants to restore and give us stewardship. The first thing he did for us as human beings when we left the, or when we left the garden was to say, steward the whole earth. And we're called to stewardship, even to give Jesus back something that he's worthy of when he does return. But to have the Pope and ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople and have the Swami um, Saraswati from India, and to have the Imam 
Basil, Abdul, Rauf, and Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg, and more people giving these 10 principles. Now, the principles themselves are not like terrible. They're, they're not, I mean, they're things that we think people should do, like everything from, you know, everything in life is interconnected, don't harm anyone, look out for tomorrow, rise above the ego you have, repent and turn from every action that would matter against the world, open your heart, all these things, you know, like all these things that they say. Ro Ro uh, Rowan Williams, a former Archbishop of Canterbury said, we've tried to formulate 10 principles, what we call climate repentance, that is an acknowledgement we're, that we're all we are as a human race have fallen short. So basically everyone's fallen short, but, but then they broke these new tablets. They created tablets like what Moses had and then broke them together as a sign, a prophetic act, they called it, that we would do better as humans. Not really honoring God of the Bible, just honoring all the gods that humans could come up with this plan. And this is where it gets humanistic. Humans come up, can come up with a plan to solve world issues with our own strength. If we just get together the most powerful religious leaders that will all change. And again, I am not a conspiracy guy, but this was not a Christian effort. And this was not a, an empowered event. Uh, an empowered event would be to say, as humans, we're going to agree to these things. And several religions come together and say, we agree to these things, but not to act like it's a prophetic. They actually said it was a powerful prophetic event to bring these spiritual powers together in unity this way before. I just thought it was really sad and that it was a really sad undertaking. You know, Steve Milloy, uh, Mil sorry, Steve Malloy, I had to say his name right, the editor of the website Junk Science, which is a really interesting website. He said, he asked the question, if you're Al Gore or if you're jo John Kerry, if you're any climate activist, how do you walk this back? Nothing's happened. We've been doing this for 30 years, and these people have come up, out with direst warnings, by the way, none of which have turned out to be true. This is actually well thought through. This is well researched. Nothing has come true that they've said for 30 years' time. How do they walk it back? They can't. They just have to keep it going, raising trillions of dollars through people. Wow, it's just it's just so sad. So I just think, you know, we have to look at these kinds of situations and go, okay, God, you do want us to care about the climate and the environment, and you do want us to make a big effort. But this kind of effort that's done in the name of human unity, that's done with spiritual emphasis that actually strips Christianity of its power and impact and creates, I mean, if you see the, the Ten Commandments that came up with, they're like these green, you know, little cardboard <laughs> commandments that they break. It's so sad. And I just felt like it was a, I, I would give them a, an A for effort, but a D minus for execution because they didn't honor any of the religions that were present, including Christianity. And they actually, again, strip Christianity of its power. And Christians, we do need to care about these things. Even if you don't care about climate change traditional, we do need to care about the environment. We're called to steward the environment. So what does that look like to steward agriculture, to steward the environment and emissions and all these things? And well, it doesn't look like extremism but it does look like something. So what does that look like? And let's pray into that. Let's believe as a Christian that we're called to steward the earth and not go after these extreme, you know, climate control agendas that are out there. I also wanted to talk to you guys today about uh, Disney, which seems to be hiding its new film, Strange World. The identity politics are back. Disney's looking to sexualize your teens through their new movie, Strange World, with a new gay teen romance, not just a teen that's gay, but an actual romance that plays out in the movie. I have not seen the movie, but this is being report, reported and touted as a victory in identity politic movement. So this is a movie that is made for and promoted to little kids. And this is what they're giving as gay homosexual agenda, where there's teenagers who are having sexual uh, connection or chemistry towards each other. Bob Iger is in control of Disney again after Bob Chopek, is, its formal CEO, has helped Disney lose a record amount of money. I think they've lost one third of their total revenue and income of the year. Their stock's down by at least one third, and they are not wanting to go the route of Facebook, who has lost the most money of any business in history, and how people are beginning to distrust Facebook to the core and not engaging their new products like their virtual reality Oculus. Disney seems to be sacrificing this movie after having similar problems with the bomb of a movie Lightyear, which is so interesting because Lightyear, they put so much money in the marketing campaign and considering how much money they put in and what they thought the return would be, they lost around what was projected about $200 million. They don't want to do it again. So they've actually buried this movie. The marketing budget is so low because it's between Wakanda Forever and their upcoming Avatar, which they have big hopes for. So have you seen an advertisement for this movie? Probably not. And if you have, you haven't seen 7 to 20 like you usually see for a Disney movie that's in a feature film. There's also been movies like uh, Disenchanted on Disney Plus that's had more marketing time and more marketing dollars spent on it. And it's not even a feature release. 
they, you know, they have, they're banking on some of their newer, bigger movies. And they're also looking at this identity politics stuff and really evaluating it as a company. So we need to pray that mom and advertising makes perfect sense. When you think about the fact that Lightyear, which I saw the movie Lightyear, and it was just a boring movie. It wasn't just the homosexual inclusion, but it was a boring movie. You think about that movie was supposed to be the epic that Andy from that Toy Story movies, the future movies that were actually the past, he was supposed to buy a Lightyear doll because he was so impressed with Buzz Lightyear in his story. I would have never bought as a little boy a Lightyear doll because it wasn't an interesting movie. So where did Buzz Lightyear's story originate? It originated from a, a half-hearted, like really badly done movie. And now we have Strange World, which are hoping to turn into a franchise with a first plus size uh, heroine and their, you know, this, the homosexual politics that are inside of it. And then also some of the major celebrities that are in it. You would think there would be a lot more marketing and there just isn't. Most other countries like China and Russia will not show the movie because the LGBTQ plus agenda and like Lightyear, there's no way to take it out uh, or, or gloss over it like they do in some of the other movies that they've done in the past. So meanwhile, Christian conservatives are creating movies and TV shows for kids that you just don't have to worry about all with the quality that you'd hope for from a Disney. Angel Studios has announced their Wing Feather Saga, which our family is really looking forward to. It's based on a best-selling uh, novel series called The Wing Feather Saga. And there's also a high-level animated film that uh, is looking for crowdsourcing about the life of David that looks extremely well done, like, like Disney-quality film that they're working on right now. And you can actually go to thedavidmovie.com. I'm not with them. They haven't asked me to promote it. But I want to see the movie. I want to see what they're working on. I've seen some of the clips so far of what they put out there as teasers. And I think it's really important that we support Christian and faith-based and family content that doesn't bow down to identity politics right now. I think of the uh, Academy Awards, how they put out new um, new requirements if you want an Academy Award, that you have to have inclusion of certain agendas in your movies. You have to hit one of four categories. And some of those categories I agree with. There should be more racial inclusion and diversity. There should be more women empowered because there was so much, there's so men heavy. I mean, some movies were 90% or more men heavy, both the creators, the writers, and also the actors and the influencers. And there was even a, a you know, disengagement from how much women versus men were being paid. That's been course corrected a lot in Hollywood and especially through the Academy's new, uh, you know, their, their new agenda in this. You can't win an Academy Award unless you have that inclusion. But one of the fourth and the final inclusion would be there has to be LGBTQ people working on the film and also their stories have to be represented, not just as an included character, but now they want story to be included as well. So you have to get one of the four or two of the four categories in a major way to even be considered. So that means that Christians who are conservative, like we're going to be talking about Candace Burr in just a moment, well, which I think we'll just get to now because I'm talking about this. But you know, when you look at like Candace Burr, she was facing a firestorm of criticism. Now this is just a TV actress on Full House who's been in a lot of Hallmark movies who started a, a company with another group, the Gr Great American Family Channel, and they're making 18 films, and they're all working on family-based content, you guys, family-based content from more of a traditional family point of view. And she's coming under fire because they said that they would not be featuring LGBTQ plus characters because that's not what she's coming out of her core identity and her core family that she feels like she's supposed to be serving the values that she has. And she comes out, out of this place of just, making movies that are relevant to her heart and how she's raising her children, how she's raising her family. And she gets in trouble with the woke agenda of Hollywood. And I think it's so sad that so many people come against her. But what is even more cool though, is that in the midst of people like Jojo Suwa, who is uh, you know LGBTQ plus person who came against Candace, Candace just a few months ago, and they had this public feud and then Candace solved it by her act of love and generosity to call her and just do a really classy thing. I covered this in a, in a past show. And Jojo, who is known, who has products and Target and many other stores right now who's become an icon for LGBTQ uh, community has or plus community. She's was so mad that Candace would make movies for her core audience for that didn't represent her people. And it was so wild because at first when you see some of the tweets that went out about Candace and about, you know, about on Jojo's actual thread where she's so mad at Candace and Candace is an awful person. So many of the, the blue checked Hollywood stars who you would expect to be more uh, not neutral about this, but be more like on JoJo's side. We're saying, JoJo, it's just like homosexuals have an agenda and they want movies that are made for that agenda. Well, Candace has an agenda of family and that's how she represents it. And we should support that. There, there's different types of movies that can be made and she's not anti, she's just not promoting and that's okay. And so many different people came to Candace's defense, again, who are blue check mark celebrities, producers, directors, and came to her defense. I was shocked. I was shocked. I was loving it. But, you know, she has so much respect. She's an example of a, a person in the entertainment industry of when people don't like your principles and treat you with the same kind of intolerant attitude, 
and they're accusing you have uh, accusing you ha of having like that you're being intolerant. She's not being intolerant. She's making movies that fit the narrative of her heart culture, her family culture, and her life culture. And people who are accusing her of being intolerant are the ones who are actually those religious crusaders out there. And I just think it's so intense that we're having to face this again uh, on this level. But I think it's so cool how Candace has set up. She's become one of my heroes. I never really paid attention to her career because I'm not a big Full House fan. I don't watch Hallmark movies. But watching her in Hollywood in this last season has been absolutely crazy awesome. And I hope you guys also um, will watch her movies on the Great Family Movie Channel, uh, or Great Great American Family Channel. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, let me get to, I just want to cover this real fast because we had a couple of the families that reached out. The verdict in Wisconsin man who drove SUV through Christmas parade he was found guilty of all 76 charges. The man's name is Daryl Brooks. He was convicted of killing six and injuring multiple more with the SUV and a Christmas parade. And the judge pronounced so many years in sentencing as a symbol to the families. She wanted to make sure, I don't know if you guys watched this at all, but she wanted to make sure the families saw the symbol. It was that this was not okay. She also went on to state that he wasn't mentally ill, but he was pure evil. And Daryl, who defended himself, was erratic, irreverent, narcissistic, and just sad. If you watch this case at all, it's a victory for many who were involved, including several believers who were injured during the vicious attack, including one of their mothers who passed away. And that some of them had reached out to us and just for prayer, for perspective, and were asking us to pray for the, the, the court because many of them were going in and actually you know, speaking on behalf of their family members who were hurt. Some of the children were hurt. And then this one man who lost his mother, who's a Christian, who was just praying about representing her well, not with a spirit of anger, but with a spirit of justice for what had happened to her. And again, this man was just pure evil. And just watching him, I, I pray he gets saved before someone kills him in jail because there's no one who's gonna let him live after he's a child killer. I just pray he gets saved. He was so vile that uh, he, he you know, some people were saying he deserves everything he gets. No, he, he deserves to get saved and repent for what he's done. That's what I'm hoping will happen because we're praying for spiritual justice. Not all jail time in this kind of situation actually works out to do any good for anybody. So we want spiritual justice, just like Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer got radically saved. Some people don't believe that, but I've talked to his pastor. That was his pastor in jail. He got baptized, saved, and repented for everything he had done and realized that it was done out of an act of evil, not out of insanity. He never claimed mental illness. He said he was literally choosing evil in his life. And when you deal with these kinds of situations, the only, the only thing these people have left is salvation. There's nothing good that can come in their life without salvation. They've ruined their earthly opportunity. God can restore all things. And he did restore. Jeffrey Dahmer brought a bunch of people to God and to Christ in prison. And God restored that place of influence he was supposed to have before committing such heinous crimes. But it's it's very limited. It's in the prison system. And if you're a prisoner, I don't want to put limitations on you. But I do want to say that when we choose, if you're a pre-criminal, when we choose to abandon or commit spiritual suicide on our calling by doing something so heinous and so evil, there is ramifications for the rest of your life. And though God can restore identity, he can restore who you are in him as a son or a daughter of God. There's a measure of your calling that you'll never enter into the same way he intended it, though he will recreate your life and give you a place of thriving and enjoying life. If you'll give your life over to him, he'll give you a place. He'll deliver you from anxiety and, and self-hatred and all these things. But you have to turn to him for that to happen. And many of these criminals uh, go through a type of salvation in jail, but they don't live it out when they do get released. This particular man will never be released. So the best he can have is salvation in prison. So let's pray for that. God can turn anything for the good of those who love him. And God's even turning this for the good of those who loved him in this parade, who lost somebody or who uh, had an injury. And one of the young girls is brain damaged for the rest of her life because of this, unless Jesus heals her. But God can still work this for his good. And I believe he will. So let's be praying for those families now that the verdict's been given. I think it was an epic verdict. I'm so glad it was given. And I believe we want spiritual justice even more than natural justice. So let's pray for that. Okay, so before we get to our main stories, I just wanted to cover this. The Barna Group released a really interesting study. This, this uh, I think it was this month. 54% of those who experience generosity themselves, according to the Barna Group, um, were have directly experienced generosity because they gave. So data from why giving is good showed that the re uh, reciprocated generosity is especially prominent amongst practicing Christians. This is so cool. You cannot outgive God and God always brings, I mean, giving starts something anyways. It's just, this, it has 
an anointing to it. But when you give, you always receive back. It's just so cool. 54% of people who give say that they have had reciprocated generosity back to them. The majority of whom say they have been the recipient of someone's generosity now are motivated uh, to model generosity for others by 65%. So once you've been given something back, you want to model or give that back to it's pay it forward, basically. Asked if they've ever been the recipient of someone's extraordinary generosity, just under half of the U.S. adults, 46% say yes. Another 43% indicate they have not, while 11% say they're unsure. This decline among the general population is receiving generosity compared to practicing Christians, hence to the influence of faith and community and practice might uh, might have on one's experience with generosity. First, practicing Christians may have a higher chance of being exposed to generosity. For instance, amongst practicing Christians, over 55% currently give to a church, compared with 25% of all those self-identified Christians. Because practicing Christians are more likely to be around other practicing Christians in the church environment, there's a greater chance for someone to be both a participant in and recipient of a generous community. Second, I love this, like we need to be involved with local church. Second, practicing Christians may be more apt to notice generosity in their everyday life. This is so cool. So when you're giving and you're practicing and as part of a community of church and you're giving regularly, you notice generosity more. So you're setting yourself up neurologically and spiritually for more giving. The church puts great emphasis on the topics of generosity and gratitude. In fact, nearly three quarters of practicing Christians say their pastor often speaks from the pulpit on generosity. It is possible that greater awareness is a result of higher priority. In general, givers are significantly more likely to say they have received generosity in the past 54% say yes, compared to 36% of non-givers. Often those who currently practice generosity have not only been recipients of generosity, but have also seen it modeled for them. Now, they desire to be model of generosity for others. Again, this is like 79% of practicing Christians say generosity was taught to them. The trends are above noteworthy. I love this. It's a, it's a cycle of generosity that happens when you start giving, especially when you're part of you know a, a generous church or a generous Christian faith. It causes a huge difference in the world around you. And I know for us, we've been challenged over the last 20 years to really be generous givers. My wife and I, over the last 10 years of our marriage, have helped start schools in Congo. We've helped, you know, anti-human trafficking groups. We've helped our local church, of course, for tithers. We believe at least 10% of our income should go. And we do that not just because it's a biblical principle or because we're trying to be religiously you know, sound, but we also believe that we watch God move on our behalf and do more when we're generous. It, it causes more favor. It causes more opportunity. It causes more connection to ourselves, to our family, to our core values. I mean, my daughters are generous because they watch us give to the poor. We show them pictures. Here's the kids we're giving to in Congo. These are the schools through Justice Rising. I mean, these th these are the, the victims that have been you know saved from trafficking. These are, We don't explain trafficking because they're too little, but they, who were slaves, we'll tell them that. And these are the little girls. Look at Unlikely Heroes. You know, look at these organizations we're giving to. And they now have that in their hearts. And I just love that because they now are givers all the time. They're thinking, what toys should we give? What should we do? Yeah, every every kind of giving thing that's around us, even if it's a homeless person that they see, they want to give and we nurture that in them. And I love that because they have a role model. So I can't wait to see what they will do when they're adults. But isn't that beautiful? I love that. Well, we have a lot more on this episode. All of our main stories we're about to cover, but I wanted to share that our brand new Spiritual Growth Academy has launched this year with a four-week class and one event every month on subjects. Of, they're really going to 10X your faith, for real. They're going to 10X your spiritual growth. We cover a lot on hearing God's voice. I cover the prophetic ministry quite a bit. But we also bring other people to cover it. Dream interpretation, deliverance. We're talking about angels next month, or I guess uh, that would be uh, January. We talk about all these emotional, healthy, you know, living of spiritual leadership type topics. And we have a one-time low price that we're doing for Black Friday, and we're starting it now, and also Cyber Monday, because we want to, uh, we want you guys to get a hold of this, and you guys can get the whole year of classes for only $200. It's normally $25 a month, so it's quite a savings, and we really want the capital to build out the community features, so we're giving this kind of a sale because we're trying to onboard many of you so we can really build out our Discord channel, all of our Zoom features that we have. So come join us at the Spiritual Growth Academy with hundreds of other students that have already enrolled. And you're going to get the deal of a lifetime because we're never going to do this deal again. $200. You're getting over a $100 discount just by joining today. And you can also buy this for a friend. You can buy this for a family member. We also have all of our resources in our ministry are 40% off, which is our lowest sale we've ever done. Come get a book on Breakthrough Prayer or a Masterclass on Hearing God's Voice or a Kids Chapter Book, Growing Up With God. This is a perfect way to give gifts this year 
Because when you give the gift of spirituality that connect people to God in a season where it's so easy to be disconnected, it changes everything. So I'm gonna encourage you guys to do the gift giving that really makes sense, which is the gift giving of spiritual gifts to help people grow in their spiritual lives. Ah, oh, I love this. Well, we, story number one, I wanna just tell you, this is a hard one and I'm gonna try not to spend too much time on this because we are already 30 minutes into the show, but politics in America, where do we go from here? Trump announces, Biden announced also in response, Gavin Newsom is reportedly sending out his official feelers. Will Ron DeSantis run for president? So we already have some presidential stuff happening on, uh, on right now. We also, what does it mean now that Republicans are in control of the House? You know, the Respect for Marriage Act also came out. Nancy Pelosi steps down from leadership, but it's also facing an incoming investigation for the Republican-run Congress. Republicans are also declaring an investigation on Joe Biden. They've even implicating him and his son and human trafficking. They're going to be doing this investigation. I mean, this is the day that is crazy. We've never been at a place, no other generation has been at a place where there's this much corruption on display and where we're seeing people are going to be investigated on this level. We've already had the investigations against Trump. Mar-a-Lago, they found nothing. So far, there's been nothing at Mar-a-Lago that they found. Uh, the January 6th uh, hearings, they found really nothing. There was nothing so far. So we'll see what they find with Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden. But it's just been the wild west of politics right now. And at the, you know all the main midterms, except Georgia, have pretty much been decided. As Ben Shapiro says, it was a little red trickle. But you know you have these things that that are happening right now, like the Respect for Marriage Act, uh, you know, the Senate and Nancy Pelosi with Congress and Joe Biden are trying to pass this. And it was really sad because the way that they were passing this is they combined the uh, the Homosexual or Same-Sex Marriage Act with also Interracial Marriage Act. So you don't want to say no to interracial marriage because we all, 99% of all Americans want interracial marriages to work and they feel like they should be, they should be respected and that they should there should be an act of congress to reverse any decision that was ever made against interracial marriage but why was that on the same ticket as lgbtq marriage i don't understand that at all neither do most americans and this is being passed through so that it can solidify same-sex marriages as a federal law so that local states cannot decide this for themselves this is going to cause us to look at maybe 2024 reversing some of this but it's going to be really interesting a lot of republicans voted for this just because they were told you're going to vote against interracial marriage. And so they voted for this because th there was pressure, peer pressure put on them to vote for something or else they would look like racists. And so it was really sad. I hate politics sometimes, how they put us through this gamut. But, you know, this changes nothing about the status of same-sex marriage in America. However, the legislation is raising enormous questions about the First Amendment protections for those who support traditional marriage on religious grounds and explicitly declaring the Bible is wrong is what they were saying on, Bi on Monday the bipartisan group of senators announced that they had crafted common sense language to confirm that this legislation fully respects and protects Americans' religious liberties and diverse beliefs while leaving intact the core mission of the legislation to protect marriage equality. According to CBS News, the amendment ensures nonprofit religious organizations will not be required to provide services, facilities, or goods for the celebrating of same-sex marriages and protects religious liberty and conscious, conscientious protects uh, available under the Constitution and federal law including the Religious Freedom Act uh, or Restoration Act. But however, U.S. Senator Pat Toomey opposed the legislation warned that it threatens religious liberty. This legislation would enable activists to sue faith-based groups that provide vital services to our communities and attempt to force them to abandon their deeply held beliefs about marriage or close their doors. He added the Respect for Marriage Act does not provide any meaningful benefit to same-sex marriages that does not already exist. It does significantly threaten religious liberty. Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York, chairman of the Catholic Bishops Committee of Religious Liberty, likewise warned the bill will be a narrow arrow in the quiver of those who wish to deny religious organizations liberty to freely exercise their religious duties, strip them of their tax exemptions, or exclude them from full participation in the public arena. Matt Sharp, senior counsel with the Alliance Defending Freedom, also warned that the legislation could open Christians up to lawsuits at a federal level noting that believers running businesses and charitable organizations could be at risk. He also questioned whether some Christian nonprofits could find their tax exemption status in peril. Rabbi Yaakov Minkin, the founder of Project Genesis and the managing director of the Coalition for Jewish Values, said in Tuesday interview with RFMA as the federal government's explicitly declaring the Bible is wrong. He noted that it allows any private actor to initiate a lawsuit if a religious school wishes to recognize only traditional marriages. In his view, the act means exposing our community to a host of bad actors willing to engage in lit uh, litigation. 
So in a day when six in 10 Americans say legalization of six uh, same-sex marriages is good for society, we should not be surprised that Congress would follow suit. And we should not be surprised when those who defend traditional marriage must pay a price for our biblical, biblical convictions. And this is just true. We need to really be praying. And some of you wonder why we cover political topics. A lot of the reasons is because of stuff like this. We could actually vote on a local level, and then we could vote on a national level to overturn these things. Christians are the silent majority. And unfortunately, we're disengaged. And because we need to wake up. There's a sleeping giant of faith-based community around the nation. If we wake up, things will change. If we do not wake up, we're going to see more and more extreme leftism that scares you because it's going to take the freedom away from your grandchildren to be able to be normal business owners with faith-based values. It's going to take any conservatism out of normal relationships. We're watching people get sued for not making cakes or cupcakes for gay weddings. And that should just not happen in a free country. We need to see a change, a big change. And part of that is that you engage politics. Now, I know politics can be intense and sometimes so divisive in our families. And some of us over whether it's the vaccinations or whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden or whether it's, you know, some some issues that people on the left believe and some issues that people on the right believe, they've been so divisive. We have to come to a place where we realize that Jesus and having the love of Jesus in common is everything. And that these are secondary issues that we should not allow ourselves to violate love for. We need to look at love first, but we also have to look at these issues as we go and, and discern them and, and have wisdom about them so that we don't allow legislation to pass like this. Again, people can get married to whoever they want to get married unless it affects my freedom to teach my children, my freedom to raise my family. I think freedom to make free choices, God is all about that. He gave man a free choice, but when it violates other human beings, that's when we have to fight. We have to fight with all of our might. And right now there's some things to fight about, which I think is really important to look at. Okay, story number two, this is, this is big. This is big, Twitter lost upwards of possibly up to 95% of its workforce after Elon Musk put many on notice, then did it again, offering only three months severance, which some people think is very generous, some people don't, uh, in a rocky economy. The ones who were left were able to not only keep Twitter moving forward, but watch as Twitter is the most vocal social media platform this week. Not only that, Musk did a public poll with his followers to see if Donald J. Trump should be reinstated, and over 15 million people voted on one of the largest ever internet polls, and the resounding community said yes, and Donald's account not only got reinstated, but grew to 87 million people overnight. This makes President Biden's account look very small in comparison. Twitter also reinstated Yay West, Babylon B, and many other conservative voices. Many mainstream media outlets protested immediately and began making declarations. They would pull out and must seem to just troll them, including CBS and Jimmy Fallon. CBS said they were pulling out while they did an investigation. The investigation lasted two days. And they went back on. CBS has been losing ratings and losing viewers for a number of years now. And I think this would have cost them too much when they they claim to be more of a middle ground reporting institution. But they ended up coming back. And uh, Elon even trolled them when they came back. Jimmy Fallon said he was leaving forever. And uh, Elon must seem to troll him as well as probably 100 other people, too. He's been very active. Uh, as When he says he's the chief twit, he really is. He's tweeting all the time, responding to Little guys and we're signing to big guys. Twitter seems to be the place to talk about noteworthy news right now with its armchair journalists and social commentators. And it's been really interesting to watch just different people's responses. I've, I've had a lot more engagement on Twitter than I've ever had because I think a lot of conservatives are going back there now. If you've heard my spiritual or prophetic perspective, I believe that God's giving freedom of speech back to Americans and back to the world through social media platforms like Twitter. And I think that we're going to see a big change because God wants to raise up voices right now that are going to last decades. And so these voices need places to emerge. And we're watching places like sometimes YouTube, sometimes Facebook, Instagram, and others take voices out take them down because they disagree with core pol politics or core policy. And that's not freedom of speech. If we say something that is terroristic, if we say something that's scary or a threat against somebody else, I agree, take them down. But if you say something that's just emotionally different or disconnected from your philosophy of life, that should not be taken down. These are not extremist statements like an extreme Muslim and extreme Christian and then a normal Christian are being compared to the same thing. A normal Republican is being compared to people who are extremists in, in the Republican community. That's not fair. And so we're seeing Twitter is rebalancing instantly. We're seeing a, a coming to the middle of, hey, can we play nice? Can we play fair? And this will put pressure on Facebook, who's lost more money than any company in history because of their agenda. Uh, Facebook and Instagram, WhatsApp, all these apps that they have are losing people by the, the millions every month. Millions are leaving 
Facebook every month this year. So we're watching that happen. And a lot of it is because people don't feel safe there anymore. They don't feel connected there anymore. I love one uh, Twitter uh, responder said, now it's time to take out pornography. And Elon said, check, got it. We're working on that. So it looks like that where Twitter has been this incredible, awful place for pornography where all this, uh, all the, the checks and balances aren't there. People could be any age and be on there for pornography. It looks like they're going to do a sweep over that too. Let's pray for that because a lot of human trafficking happens over their social media apps because of this pornography that gets on there. So that's really exciting to me as well. Well, here we go. In a country like America where we have a population crisis, where not enough people are being born to sustain our nation, we have a problem. Part of this very problem is that people aren't getting married young enough and many aren't having children or are having too few children. One of the first things God ever did for man is give us a partner and tell us to go forth and be fruitful and multiply. There's a blessing on marriage and a blessing on family that's not found anywhere else. Now hear that. There's a blessing that happens when you get married and there's a blessing on family that was never proclaimed by the Bible for singleness. I loved my single days. I was single until I was 37. It was glorious. I loved it. It was, it was part of what God had for me in a season of life. But I found a blessing in marriage and I found a blessing with my children that that multiplied me as a human being that caused me to live a different quality of life because it's biblical. And many of you heard my uh, word a few weeks back about how God's commissioning heaven to bring people together in 2023 like never before, especially people in those 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, people who feel like they're past the age of having babies or people who feel like they're past the age of having true romance. God is bringing people together. We're watching it. I had... I think we had 30 something thousand downloads of that prophetic word. We also had, you know, 20,000 downloads of that episode where I released the word. And we've had so many responses, over a thousand responses from you guys on all of our platforms and emails of you guys, especially people are saying, I knew I was called to get married, but I had given up hope. And this caused me to say, I want to be ready again. Well, today we have a special guest, but it's put together teaching in an organization all about helping people find their purpose in marriage. And this is going to be awesome. So Ryan, come on up. Hey, Sean. Great to great to be able to join here and follow that amazing prophetic word as you were just talking about there and our role within that in terms of kingdom coupling. Well, I'm so, to describe that, kingdom coupling as the name of your organization. That's such a fun term. Like, talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So the kingdom coupling, really, it's this idea that I was, we're doing more than just working with, with singles and, and developing relationships. But it's this idea that the, the main role of a marriage is to, to be able to better serve the kingdom of God, to glorify God. Is it one of the key roles that really there's kind of two key roles that I see in terms of a suitable helper being played? One is to help you glorify God. That's so cool. Like, you know, I don't think a lot of people think that yeah. way. And I know when I was single, and there's a pressure, especially if you live, live in a big city like we're in L.A., there's a pressure not to get married. There's a pressure to do yeah. your big career first, your big, you know, make your big dreams come true first. And then afterwards, you know, get married. Or there's a pressure from parents to say, go to college first and then you find somebody. There's all these weird pressures that are not in every country, but happen to be in our country where, I mean, I just read an article with Jennifer Aniston and several others who were sharing, I wish I had frozen my eggs. I don't have a chance to have babies now. I don't have a chance to have a real life of family now in the same way. Maybe I can foster, maybe I can adopt, but it's just, not the same for what I was expecting in life. So there's this move of people who are expressing disappointment, like in the Hollywood Reporter and other places. But then there's this tension. So talk about the noteworthy culture changes affecting dating right now. Yeah, I mean, that's one of them for sure is just, I think some of the well-intentioned advice that people gave young people was like, no pressure. Like, don't worry, what, you know, you got all the time in the world. Yeah. And send them out with these instructions and these goals for degrees and careers and all these sorts of things. And then they realize that actually you don't have all the time in the world. And there's a that's lot of true. important decisions to be made in your early 20s. And that's also coincides with the, you know, delayed adulting and things like that that are happening in society where people don't feel like they're ready and adults don't feel like they're ready. And so we continually perpetuate kind of the length of that singleness only to realize that there's a lot of shortcomings there as well. And I'll give you kind of two other just uh, cultural changes that I think have had huge imp implications over the last century or so, yeah. which one is I'm reminded of what Jesus says actually to, to Peter when he rebukes Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. And in the new living translation, it just caught my eye because it said, get behind me, Satan, for you are a dangerous trap to me. Wow. And I was like, wow, like what is Satan's dangerous trap? And Jesus says, for you're merely seeing things from a human point of view, 
not from God's. Wow. Wow. And I think that plays hand in hand with what we're talking about here is like most people see singleness, dating relationships, hookups, engagement, cohabitation, marriage. They're seeing it merely from a human point of view and not from God's. And when we do that, we fall into a lot of susceptibilities that end up having negative implications in our lives. Whereas we, if we were to actually take a step back and reinsert the biblical values and actually see singleness from God's point of view, see dating and God honoring dating from his point of view, what would that look like? Wow. What would that sound like? What kind of progression would that be on? You don't ever think about that dating being blessed by God. You just don't think about that. And yeah, you know, when you're well, single, then, you're not thinking like, how is God going to bless my dating life? You're thinking about who am I going to connect to? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what we do in this course is that by helping people understand how to date in a, in a glorifying way for God, what the byproduct of God honoring dating is, is that it's competent and sound and it actually allows mm -hmm. you to date more successfully. And so it goes hand in hand with that. Wow. As well. So talk about that for a minute, because what, what do Christian dates need to be the most mindful of? Cause like people are like wanting to go on dates here. Let me say this too. It's a lot of people who reach out to us. We're saying, I hate online dating sites, you know, or I've done them and I didn't hate it. I actually liked it, but I didn't find anybody through it. There was no one compatible. My sister, there's a guy in our church at the time years ago who was like one of the most dysfunctional and healthy guys who just, mm -hmm. just was, it's just true. And, and had a lot of rejection on his life. And she got through three different dating services that she was looking at. That's who I was trying to match her to. And she's like, ah, there's no one in my, and I live in a big city. Like there's no one in my, you know, realm that would even be qualifiable through a dating site. So I don't know how to find somebody. Should I go to a bigger church? Cause she was in our small church at the time. How do I even find somebody? How do I even look at this? One of the things that you're doing is you're teaching people how to be prepared, how to prepare yourself for God's plan of dating. So talk about that and talk about what is a su successful date in God. Yeah. Well, we'll, I'll give you kind of five keys that, that we have kind of boiled it down to a little bit. And I'll even give you an example with this couple, I Isabel and Levi. Uh, Isabel was a student of mine. She went through the kingdom coupling course and eventually found Levi through a dating app. And actually she then kind of brought him into the course material and they worked through it. And Levi was 24 when they met. And I kind of attached a lot of the course material with their success on these five things, which is one, having your identity, your value, worth, and, and dignity anchored in Christ. Yeah. So can you be firmly rooted? And that allows you to actually date out of the fullness of your life, not out of the emptiness. Wow. And the hard That's reality good. is that probably 90% of daters out there are dating out of the emptiness in their life. So true. And so that's, that's number one. And number two is know what you want is that a lot of people are, you know, just out there casually dating, really haven't thought about what are the practical things that I want from a future husband or from a future wife or a future co-parent to children yeah. and thinking about it from that perspective. So know what you want. Number three is be able to recognize it when you find it. Have you actually been able to kind of train your mind and also think about boundaries and accountability that allow you to be able yeah. to spot these I think about a meme, mm -hmm. like I've posted a couple of different versions of it where it's like a girl who's going, God, send me my husband. And then it sends her somebody who's like, no, not him. <laughs> it's like, I love that one. No? Number three. Yeah, is it's this idea of you need to be more picky about things. Uh, this is from Logan Yuri, a researcher in relationships. She said, you need to be more picky about the things that truly matter for the long haul of a relationship yes. and less picky about the things that don't. And unfortunately, people get picky about things that have no bearing on future marital success. Which is all. so true because like Sheree and I, when we had these talks, I was listening for how does she do finances? How does yeah. she do? How does she want to raise children? How does she spend her rest time and her alone time? How does she like, how does she get refilled? Like, that's what I wanted to know. I wasn't like, where do you like to walk on sexy dates? So, you know, like I wasn't thinking about all that. I was thinking about like, are you a companion and are you are, do we have friendship chemistry and I, the romance chemistry was already somewhat there. It's like it was really there, but but like like I want to know those deeper things. And I feel like a lot of people when I when I've done especially pastoral councils in the past, I've, I've been a little while since I've been there. It's just so shallow. So I love that you're saying that. Yeah, yeah, and that uh, and then that kind of leads to number four, which is understanding your compatible nature with another person in terms of compatibility of personality yeah. and life goals and other key monumental things. So and then number, <clears throat> really number five, 
excuse me, is to be willing to commit. And that was kind of the surprising thing when I go back to Isabel and Levi, who I mentioned, is that he was 25 or he was 24 when they met. He, she was actually his first date connection through the app. Okay. And yet he went in having his, his identity anchored in Christ. He knew what he wanted. He was able to recognize it, have the boundaries and accountability in place so that he could recognize it when he found it. He understood how to seek out as well as she did on her end as well to understand the compatible nature of the two. But the crazy, the, the most impressive thing about Levi is that he was willing to commit wow. to the first person that he found wow. on this dating That's app. That's huge. And at the age of 24, and they got married when he was 25. But most people, even though they would say that they're looking for a marital relationship, they might find the right person, but they keep on swiping, trying to find the 2.0 version. Oh, and wow. They aren't truly wow. willing to yeah. commit. Yeah, it's so funny because who you marry, they, they are a human being. And no matter what, there's going to be times you feel dissatisfied, they feel dissatisfied with you. But when you have that God element to it, where you can look back at God and, and, and even have that relationship with God to say, okay, show me them again. Yeah. Connect my heart again. Like, help me again and engage in the way I'm supposed to. Sharina and I went through that when we were dating a couple of times. We've never gone through it when we're married. I mean, why we were married, it's like, we've gone through disappointments, I'm sure, with each other. But like, we've always been able to reground ourselves in the truth. But again, like, I, I'm hoping that as people listen to you, that they really feel that connection of it's worth dating. You can find somebody. Absolutely. You guys have an organization, kingdom, kingdomcoupling.com, where you have courses on how to become dateable and how to, how to like give yourself in the context of relationship. Tell us about the actual course. And then I think you said you had a special promo code for us. Yep. Yeah. So the course is honestly, it just feels like God just gave us such incredible insights and revelation. And it's a really unique compilation of ideas coming from a lot of different authors and, and scholars and teachers and, and biblical wisdom. So it's a unique combination of being based on biblical wisdom social science insights and practical engagement. Wow. That's awesome. And it takes them through 10 key components to this process of why intentions, expectations, boundaries, compatibility, aesthetic display, self-presentation, tools for evaluation, social support and location. And we walk them through that, how to understand that on each of those three levels, biblically, social science research and practical wow. application. But giving them hope that, that they're there is somebody out there because here's a quick bit of hope is that we all have one friend that is married and you're, and it gives you hope because you're like, okay, if there is somebody out there in this world, for them, <laughs> so true. If they got so, married, I thought that many times when I was, like, I was like, if there's some, if they could get married, I can get married. I remember thinking that like, that is so almost bad to think that way, but it's also reality of like, okay, God, there's hope. Well, this is yeah. so good. And I think that everything you're offering here through kingdomcoupling.com I'm not here to do an infomercial. I'm here because I believe in after that prophetic word that we need some tools. And so we wanted to reach out to you and say, okay, tell us about the tool, hoping that more single people would act, actually feel empowered in the tools that they have. And so I just want to thank you so much for, for being a part of this. I know your promo code is bowls 50. If they go yep, on, they're going to get $50, $50 off, which is so yep. cool. And I, I hope we get to talk some more because this is so I just think it's right up a lot of people's alley. Let's let's do something in the future just for single people. I think it'd be really good. Let's do it. And that yeah, that code Bulls fifty is for fifty dollars off the course just for these listeners because I know that uh, you've got incredible listeners, godly followers right. that are passionate about this, that truly do want to find that next step in in glorifying God through a godly marriage. And, and we've got something amazing to, to help them and assist them. And we're there the whole way. They can always email us with questions. We're going to be adding community elements to it as well. We're going to be upgrading that over the course of 2023 with, with a lot more material. So now's the time to, to jump in on it. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for being on with us today. And you need to go get that course. We do have a prophetic word I'm about to give, but I just want to think about like for a second, Ryan, as we say goodbye, is there hope for somebody who's 35 who feels like they're unmarriable now because they, they feel past their prime. Talk to that 40-year-old woman, that 50-year-old guy who's maybe been through a divorce or been through something. Is there hope for them? Absolutely. Like God sees you. He knows your story. He knows all that you've been through. He knows all the, the doubts and concerns and, and worries that you have. And he knows the state of the culture, but he's the same God that's made a way for the Israelites through the Red Sea, which seemed impossible. Yeah. And yet he made a way. And he has a way for you. 
So keep seeking after him. Keep pouring into God. Keep going after him with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I, the verse I absolutely love is to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Mm-hmm. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And so ironically enough, there's something straight about the, even though the road feels windy and it feels like there's switchbacks at every, oh, okay. every turn. No. In a spiritual, when we see things from God's point of view, it's a direct path and he's got that for you and he sees you, he loves you. And I believe it for you. Oh, Ryan, that's so good. Well, you heard it from Ryan from Kingdom Coupling. Thanks so much for being with us, Ryan. And now I'm going to give a prophetic word that kind of goes along with relationships. Bye, Ryan. Thank you. And I'm, I'm excited about this prophetic word because this really has to do with relational alignment, which isn't just about marriage, but I think it's important that right after I gave a word about marriage a few weeks ago, that really resounded to our core audience that you guys were listening to that word, believing for marriages, godly marriages that God's sending. The God of angel armies is commissioning heaven to bring people together right now. And it's he's been doing it the last couple of years. He's doing it again. He'll always do that. But I mean, we're seeing a move of marriage that's happening. There's a strategic divine alignment as well. I have another prophetic word for you this week. And this is all about relational alignment. I'm going to read it a little bit because I did write it down. That helps me to connect you to the the fullness of it. But I do have some things that I won't read that I'm going to add to it. God's bringing relational alignment. Don't stay in the relationships you're in in a way that you are without thinking about this first. Make sure to sign up for your prophetic bulletin, though, because you'll receive my latest prophetic word and perspective via text way before the Sean Bull Show. Go to bullsministries.com and click on the prophetic intelligence briefing on the front page or click on the Bulls app and fill out your information to join hundreds of others who are on this inside of the uh, briefings of all these prophetic words, receiving our text already today. So Holy Spirit has an assignment on the earth right now to set up relationship communities, organizations, companies, ministries, and government that's going to bring about promotion of purpose, deeply connected stabilization to mainstream issues, long-lasting families, and connections that can't be bought or developed without him. He's raising up relationships that will not be pulled apart in the coming world conflicts and scandals. And he's putting a family culture in his people so that we can weather all these storms. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a dear friend that will love you no matter what. And a family sticks through all kinds of trouble. The Holy Spirit is setting you up. He's setting up networks of friends with a motivation of not just working together, but knowing one another and having each other's backs. He's shifting spheres of influence and relational circles relationships that would take a decade to develop. I can feel that for some of you right now who are even watching with us live. I know that that means I'm going to, I especially believe it for those of you who are listening back later, God is releasing relationships that would take a a decade to develop the level of trust and authentic vulnerability, but they're going to happen in like a year's time. There's an acceleration of relationship building for realignment and influence all over the world. I had a vision where I saw a net being tied together. You know, like when you see those knots, Uh, in between all those spots of rope and those knots are relationships that God has aligned or was aligning to be a strong piece of the net. This net was the divine setup for the next worldwide move of God. So your relationships that you're getting into and that you're strengthening right now are actually the commodity of God's move of love through Christianity and relationships are the key to kingdom's resources and to God resourcing people in such a strategic way right now. Your faithful and loyal commitments to your friends, partners, churches, your city, your neighborhood are going to bear so much fruit as God harvests the influence and the seedbed of love you have planted and cultivated. Now think about that. Relationships are the key and God's bringing divine alignment and bringing this divine alignment in your relationships. Many people just like you are feeling a shift in your friendship groups, in your church circles, in your business relationships, in so many different spheres. And I want to remind you of the pivot word from last week that many of you resonate with about some people even moving locations from their city or their country or change in businesses or churches. This shift is from God and is going to bring you into a place where he's going to use the net of relationships through marriage, family, friends, partners in business or projects, connections that he's breathing on in this season. And he's going to set up your life, and it's going to be a resource to you, and you're going to find yourself being a resource center for others in your relationship circles, for other companies, other ministries, other families, social issues, and for the government. Some of the people who can't be reached directly through a mission or a local church will have no problem opening their doors to you as you're relationally grafted into their life through a project or a business or another relationship. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. 
You won't lay down your life for a stranger or for someone you don't have a connection or calling to most of the time. But God is aligning people who will sacrifice greatly for each other, who will believe in each other, who will support each other. And God's promoting your relational circle, but you have to be open. This is a hard one because right now vulnerability and even coming back from the pandemic and from the lockdown and from isolation, it's hard to keep your heart open. But if you don't have an open heart, you might miss some of the relational shift that's coming, some of the alignment that's coming. Your core friendship circle might be shifting. You might have some additions. He might be calling you out of relationships that felt meaningful and partnerships that you thought would last a lifetime and agreements that you believe were for longer than they're turning out to be. Your working relationships may orbit around new people and circles of influence. Don't resist the change and also allow God to reveal people who have had bad intentions and motives, people who don't fit into your life in this season, they're energy drainers, those who have codependent tendencies that will not respect your boundaries. These ones will entrap your energy in the coming relational move of God. Ask God how to realign those relationships. That's a warning. Ask him to realign. Some of you have leeches, spiritual leeches, emotional leeches in your life that you have not been able to put up good boundaries to. God is calling you out of those relationships. Trust God with them. You are not their savior. You are not their master. Trust God for those people that they will not be leeches to you anymore. Be proactive because you need a, a full relational capacity in your next season. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion, a companion of fools suffers harm. And again, this is a warning, get rid of the leeches, get rid of as God shifts you from one sphere to the next, make sure you're not with fools, but come around the wise that God has for you because he has something for you to do and people that you will enjoy doing it with, people that you will enjoy and thrive off of the relationships and you will become a resource for them too. God's gonna allow you to see some people in their full potential, their true identities. And these are people that you will invest into relationally and to who they truly are so that when they become, they'll have the right support system around them. That means that people who are gonna become great in their place of influence are being seeded into your life right now so that you can be with them. So if they end up winning that award, they end up being that famous person, they end up becoming that influencer, become, they become a very wealthy person, they have a relational support that's with them before, during, and after. This is also happening for many of you reading or listening to this as well. People are seeing you way past your actual value to the world right now, and they're beginning to treat you in a way that will upgrade your faith and help you as you're transforming and transitioning to the call of God and what he has for you to be an influence and a voice. 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. I pray over God's relational alignment with you right now. I just pray that God will give you a fresh anointing over your connection in your family and your business sphere and in your church and your relationships and especially romance, whether you're unmarried and waiting or you're or you're already married. God wants to bless that relationship with a fresh connection. And I want to give you an activation. I want to encourage you to do a little homework and write down all of your core relational friends, your relationships that are in your sphere of influence and your calling, your career, and write down what their value of that relationship is and one of the challenges it has. Then ask God for alignment over that relationship. Like really be grateful for those alignments, those relationships, but also look at the challenges maybe that you don't look at very often because maybe you've gotten to a working relationship where you don't face that challenge every day anymore. Or maybe you do, but you've learned how to live at peace with that challenge because the benefit of that relationship is so great, but God wants to move it forward. So if he wants to move it forward, some of that's gonna be overcoming some of those things that maybe you've settled into or settled for. I know Sheree and I are always working on our marriage relationship. We sew into it every year with tools. We also connect, like we connect not just for working relationships, but we connect heart to heart regularly throughout the week. We date each other. I know with my kids, I have intentional time that's just for them, not just to do their homework and to serve them, but to intentional time that I actually have to be intentional. And there's seasons like right now where we've been pushing and working so hard that we have to get back into sync and those relationships the way that God intended us to. So sometimes you push real hard and it gets you out of sync and then you trust God to get you back in sync and the way you're supposed to be. But I wanna encourage you to do just that, to prayerfully look at your relational alignment because God is realigning so many of you right now who are watching. I'm seeing it on, uh, you know, social media right now. Some of you are saying, this is true. Don't resist the change. It's already beginning. I have new connections right now. How do I realign with an unsaved person? God will show you. These are the kinds of things that God will show you how to do. And I, I love some of the comments that we're getting right now through YouTube and through Facebook and through other uh, Rumble. Like, make sure to comment and leave what you think this means and how you're going to play out this activation in your life right now. I think it's so important. 
Well, we are coming to the end of our show, and I want to say happy Thanksgiving for those of you in America. And we also pray for those of you around the world that God would be the center of all of your holidays that are coming up, that Jesus would be the center of them. I want to make sure that you subscribe to our Sean Bull Show podcast or join us on our channel. Make sure to join our channel as a member. It helps to support us to get you great content, to have the time and the capacity and the editing and all the things we need to do this. Also, you can go to our nonprofit at bullsministries.com. It's our ministry. And we're supported by generous donors just like you. This is hard to be a voice of reason and Christianity. And it it has caused our support base to shift quite a bit, not in a bad way, but we've gone from itinerant ministry and speaking at churches and being really involved with the church to full-on media and helping you with social commentary, helping you to have a prophetic perspective. And this past year, we've shifted so much and we've been blessed to be able to do it because of your generous donations and your partnership. So I want to encourage you right now, like right now, go to bullsministries.com, click on donations. We need your donations. We need your partnership for all we're building. Our budget after coronavirus decreased by 80%. Can you imagine? 80%. And we're rebuilding right now. And you, with the help of you, we're built into a beautiful, small, but wonderful organization. So I want to encourage you to keep your partnership. Consider us for Giving Tuesday. You will get a tax receipt. We love you guys. And I want to encourage you, keep your discernment strong and keep your love on. Signing off, you guys are awesome.